Welcome back everybody, High Tech Lab here. It's about a quarter past seven on the off-grid ranch today, and I have some fun going on in the electrical room that I wanna show you guys. I think you guys will get a really good kick out of this. So what you're looking at here is the bus bar configuration that I have on the output and inputs of my inverter. Some of you guys may recall I installed a shunt here and a couple of 300 amp fuses down below, and I have some 3 8 inch thick by 3 inch bus bar and a lot of people were concerned about the safety aspect of this bus bar being open and exposed but I'm happy to report that this has been running perfectly fine for at least three years now and my favorite part about this bus bar configuration is that it's super easy to readjust and reconfigure for different battery configurations when I ditched all the lead acid batteries and switched over to lithium, I had a significantly smaller amount of batteries, so it was really easy to remove the racking and remove some of the bus bar. But the good news is I left a lot of that infrastructure in place. So at this point in time, I'm looking at upgrading batteries and adding more batteries. So it's extremely easy now for me to expand onto the system. When I fully removed all the lead acid batteries, I just had this fuse folded up essentially keeping clear so the bus bars on this half of the system were no longer live. Well now, I'm going to show you guys today how I added a Nissan Leaf 48 volt battery pack that was sent to me from BigBattery.com. I've been needing to do the capacity test on this pack for quite some time, and running in this system, I'm not getting the full capacity out of it. I'll get into more detail on that here shortly, but it's been a great help and has really kept my lithium iron phosphate cells from taking so much abuse and so much of a beating. So what I have here is a battery pack that consists of seven modules out of a Nissan Leaf, and in those modules are two cells a piece. So this is a 14S pack, and this comes pre-assembled as you see with a BMS built in, a voltage reading, a circuit breaker, and one of these gray Anderson connectors out. Now this is a number four super fine strand silicone jacketed wire. And I was able to just put some ring terminals on it over here and bolt onto my bus bars. Now what's really cool about this pack, and, and, and some may see this as a drawback, is that normally it'll stop charging at 58.1 volts and it'll be fully discharged at ballpark around 42, 44, somewhere in there. So it's, it's to full charge voltage and it's completely discharged voltage is very far apart from each other. On the other side, I have my 100 amp hour Calb lithium iron phosphate cells and these have been running really good since last June. And even though these were used cells, they're still staying within balance pretty well of each other. The one thing I don't like is I have huge loads like a five horsepower air compressor and when that fires up, there's a surge on these batteries in the ballpark of 330 amps. I have some of my settings really tuned back as far as charging goes so that I give these cells as much of a fighting chance at living as possible because normally in my application, this battery pack would be way too small and I cycle it quite a few times a day, two to three times at minimum and that can really put some wear and tear on these cells and not make them last very long. The cool part about this 48 volt battery pack that uses the leaf cells is it really takes the abuse off of the other batteries. I'm gonna show you some amperage readings under a heavy load as well as the sudden inrush of charging and you can really see how this battery pack is making my lithium iron phosphate cells last a lot longer and taking a lot of the abuse away from them. So if I go into my automation panel and go to my battery set points and statuses page, you can see currently I'm drawing about 18 amps. My battery voltage is about 54.1 volts, drawing 975 watts, and my pack is at 89% state of charge. Currently there's about half a kilowatt hour removed from this battery pack, and this calculates using the peak capacity, which it's constantly measuring every time there's a new record capacity. It adds to that and it's dividing that by the kilowatt hours until battery's full, which it calculates by multiplying the amp hours times volts over time. It's kind of a interesting algorithm, but it takes that and gives me a current state of charge. So they're at 89% right now. I have a battery drainer function, which uses my hot tub as a dump load, 
And what that does is it puts a heavy load on the battery. So if I hit start on that, it's set to 41% to stop that battery drainer, which in other words means this is now drawing 6,000 watts on these batteries. And you can hear all the cooling fans running in the background. So I've got 119 amps coming out of these batteries and they're pretty full. But if I go probe over on this leaf pack, I've got 58 amps coming out of there, which means on the other side, having 59 amps, it's really splitting the load very nice and evenly. But where this gets really interesting is when I go do something like fire up the generator. So I'm gonna stop this battery drainer and you can see that the battery wattage went down back to about a thousand watts. And if I go to my home screen, to my generator tab, I can manually start sure? the generator and it's gonna start up and turn on the battery charger. So now that the generator started up and the inverter has kicked on, I'm putting out about 60 amps out of the battery charger. And if I come over here, first off, coming out of the system is 25 amps out the inverter. But if I come over here to the cal battery pack side, there's only about seven amps going in. And if I go over here to the Nissan Leaf side, there's 27 amps going in. And what that means is when I had that heavy load, that Nissan Leaf pack took the heavy load and discharged first before the heavy load hit the cal battery pack. So it's really interesting how at these set points that this battery pack really took a lot of the load off of the cal battery pack. Now I know it's noisy in here, so I'm gonna shut the generator off and I will be right back and we can take a few more measurements. Machine is stopped. So it's very interesting to me how different chemistries, like in this case, the leaf battery pack, when paired with the calb cells can really offset those heavy loads and those heavy inrushes. And my theory is it has to do with the internal resistances of the pack. But the good news is, since the set points of this battery pack are way out of the range of the calb battery pack, they're compatible together because my system is set to run to never exceed the rating of the cal battery pack, which in my case is about 56.8 volts on charge. And I have a couple different voltages that I'll kick on the backup generator at. I'll show you those here quickly. So if you take a look, my generator start points, I have a 49.2 volt DC two minute start. So in other words, when it passes 49.2 volts on a discharge, it'll start a timer for two minutes. And so long as it remains below 49.2 volts for that whole two minutes, it'll start up the generator. I have a two hour start voltage of 51.6 volts DC. So in other words, if it drops below 51.6 volts and stays below 51.6 volts for two hours, it'll then trigger a startup cycle and run the generator until the batteries are full. And I call the batteries full when they reach a voltage of 55.9 volts and the amperage tapers down to 10 amps. If for some reason there were loads that took the amperage going into the batteries below 10 amps, but I wasn't above 55.9 volts, it wouldn't shut off the generator. So these two conditions must both be met in order for that shut off to take place. Since these batteries are so small, I know I can't make it through the night because the idle draw of the inverter will fully discharge them before the night is over. So what I do is I automatically run the generator at 3 a.m. That's hour of day start hour. And in this case, it's the third hour of the day. It's 24 hour format. That's just how I program this. And what the point is there is we want to top off the batteries, charge them until they're full. And the point of that is it should have enough power from 3 a.m. to take me until the sun rises in the morning. That way I don't have an extra start cycle at 6 a.m. when the sun is about to come up. That also means say the batteries were 75% full at 3 a.m. It only needs to do a quarter charge cycle to bring them full before stopping for the whole night and not running again. So the goal with that is that the generator is not gonna run at all after 3 a.m. And this is possible in my area because I'm so far away from my neighbors that they don't mind the generator noise because they simply can't hear it. I also have a feature that's charge until full and I can select that and it'll do a full charge, not based on time, and run until it reaches this 10 amps shutoff as well as the 55.9 volts shutoff. And then I also have a manual start where I can enter a time here with the keypad 
and that will run the generator manually for a programmable amount of time. So those are just some of the features I've implemented in my system, but the main thing is that it's really cool with this battery pack, how it takes the brunt off the rest of the batteries that are the expensive ones. I wish I had a couple more shunts so I could see how much power is going into my Fox power inverter, as well as how much power is coming out of my battery charger. But I really need to reconfigure these bus bars because I did install the shunt on the positive bus bar. And typically you would install them on the negative bus bar. That way the lines coming out of the shunt are common to ground. So if you had a short to ground, you wouldn't have the full capacity of the battery running through them. So when I install bigger batteries in here, I'm going to make sure I get a couple more shunts and install them in such a way that I can monitor everything because some of you may remember a video, if I remember I'll put a card in the top corner, where I use a thermocouple module on my PLC to monitor these shunts and since they're a millivolt output and the shunts are a millivolt output, they work very synchronous together and the results are very desirable. Anywho, I hope today's video was interesting. If you liked it, be sure to subscribe and I want you guys to comment the coolest phenomenon you have seen in an off-grid system similar to how connecting this battery on shares the power. I really want to know some of these odds and ends you guys have learned over time because I'm still learning things like this, especially considering this is my first lithium iron phosphate battery bank here. And here's a teaser for the next videos. Some of my closest followers will remember these relay boards, but I installed them in the off-grid system and I haven't made a video on it yet. Let's just say there were some sparks involved, but I've got this system figured out pretty well and ironed out some of the bugs. And I really look forward to showing you guys this later because this is really one of a kind, something I've never seen before. So subscribe so you can get a notification as soon as that video comes out. In the meantime, guys, stay safe, and I'll see you in the next video. Bye now.